The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you who... Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Several years ago, when I was younger, if somebody were to ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up, I would have responded that I want to be an architect. In high school, one of my favorite classes that I took was an architectural drafting class in which I designed floor plans, blueprints of buildings. And I remember during one project, I designed what I thought at that time was the most ideal house to live in. And it was my hope that one day as an architect, I can bring this blueprint to fruition in real life, that this floor plan would uh, be built physically. Now, years had passed, and as you could evidently see that uh, God brought me down a different path, I did not become an architect, and that blueprint did not come to fruition, but God had revealed to me that there is an even greater house to desire to be lived in. A house that has treasures that uh, moth nor rust can destroy, nor thieves can break in and steal. A house that is known and described as paradise in which no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor has it ever been conceived in the heart of man what the owner of this house has prepared for those who love him. And this house is nothing other than the house of God, the kingdom of heaven. And the good news is God has given us the blueprint. He has given us this floor plan, if you will, of the means to arrive there and to enter in. And that blueprint is found in our Holy Gospel today, which is the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are a road map, if you will, for sojourners, pilgrims here on earth, tending towards their ultimate destination. It is a recipe of spiritual ingredients for the sweetest delight, which is ultimately the vision and sight of God in eternity in heaven. Speaking of sweetness, in order for us to properly understand the Beatitudes, it would be beneficial for us to understand what a fruit is. Fruits, according to the common uses of the term, fruits are produced by a plant, and it implies a perfection insofar as it is the last stage of the plant's growth. Fruits are, are commonly sweet because they taste good, they're delicious, they bring about a certain pleasure, a delightfulness, a happiness to our palate 
our taste buds. Well, the Beatitudes in the spiritual life can be looked at as fruits because they are perfections. They are meritorious actions of excellence. And they produce sweetness. They produce a deliciousness, a delight, a happiness in our spiritual palate, which is ultimately our immortal soul. That is why, as we see the Beatitudes, the latter part of them, they speak about delights. For example, they will be comforted. They will be satisfied. They will see God, etc. So, as we see that the Beatitudes bring about a certain sweetness, a delight, it can be looked at as the Beatitudes are a foretaste, a, a small sampling, if you will, of the ultimate sweetness and delight that will ultimately be experienced in the kingdom of heaven. This is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church speaks about in paragraph 1717 when it says about the Beatitudes, they proclaim the blessings and rewards already secured, however dimly, meaning just a little bit, for Christ's disciples, meaning those who are still here on earth journeying in hope towards that ultimate end. Now, there are several Beatitudes, and unfortunately, uh, I cannot give in one uh, just single homily a in-depth commentary on every single one, but today I would like to at least comment on a select few. The first one I want to comment on is, Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Many saints and the early church fathers had a common primary interpretation of this particular beatitude of mourning, and that is, they said, that this refers to mourning for sins. St. Jerome said this, For the mourning here meant is not for the dead by common course of nature, but for the dead in sins, vices. St. Ambrose said this, It is suitable that the third blessing should be of those that mourn for sin, for it is the Trinity that forgives. We recall that when Jesus was enduring his passion, the women of Jerusalem came to him mourning. They were weeping because Jesus was experiencing this pain. And Jesus responded to them, Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. He was referring to the sins of Jerusalem which we recall was ultimately destroyed with his temple in the year 70 AD because they did not repent of their sins. And so a good question for us today is, do we weep for our sins? Do we mourn? And one of the most powerful ways in which we can mourn and also the greatest place to mourn and weep for our sins, if you will, is in the great sacrament of confession. It is in confession in which we place a humble and contrite heart to Jesus through the ministry of the priests. And that contrition that we bring should bring about a delightfulness insofar as comfort. Therefore, if we are to mourn for our sins, it is important that we understand properly what contrition is. Contrition has three facets to it. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraph 1451, it says, Contrition is sorrow of the soul and detestation for the sin committed. Another word for detestation is hatred for sin. And last but not least, thirdly, together with the resolution not to sin again. So the first one here, sorrow of the soul, the goal is to be sorry for our sins, 
ultimately out of love for God because our sins offend his love. The second one, detestation, hatred, the goal is that we should hate sin to the point that we would rather die than to offend the Lord, even to commit the slightest venial sin. For we know that even the slightest venial sin has brought our Lord to the cross. And last but not least, a resolution not to sin again. Another phrase uh, that means the same thing is a firm purpose of amendment. So a defective disposition that would be a contrary to a resolution to not sin again, we could take something that's becoming more prevalent in our culture today, is cohabitation. Let's say uh, two unmarried people, they're, they're living together and they're perpetually committing fornication, premarital sex. Well, if, if they want to go to confession and be forgiven for their sins, they need to be resolved that they're going to change their ways. They need to move out of the house. Uh, in other words, they need to stop doing what they're doing. If, if they're not resolved to do so, they are not properly disposed to receive absolution. Even if for some reason, you know, that information was, you know, uh, hidden from the priest and the priest, you know, raised up his hands and he said those words of absolution, uh, that, that person is not being forgiven of their sins. No, because there is an essential element missing on the part of the penitent. They are not truly being contrite. They are not truly mourning, if you will, weeping for their sins. So it's important that we give a truly contrite heart in that great sacrament. Secondly, the beatitude, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Notice Jesus did not just say, blessed are those who desire for righteousness. I think it's important that we uh, make a distinction between desiring and hungering and thirsting, which is typically associated with food and drink. Uh, I could desire a Lamborghini, and uh, if I don't acquire it, I could still continue to live and exist. But when I hunger and thirst for food and drink, if I don't acquire it, I'm going to eventually die. It is a necessity. Therefore, as Jesus used the terms hungering and thirsting for righteousness, it implies that righteousness is a necessity. If we don't acquire it, if we don't have it, we are going to spiritually die. And in addition to being a necessity, it is also a priority. As our Lord taught us in the Gospel of Matthew, when he speaks about the things that we need, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto it. Also, hungering and thirsting for righteousness would entail our call to be on fire for the Lord as opposed to being cold or even lukewarm towards the Lord. A spiritual maxim in the spiritual life is lukewarmness is the devil in disguise. And a person in the gospel who would display a lukewarm disposition is that account of the rich young man who was attached to his material goods. Now, he desired the kingdom for he said to the Lord, Lord, what must I do in order to enter into eternal life? And Jesus told him specifically, go, sell all of your goods and give to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven, and come follow me. And the account continues by saying that the rich young man went away sad, for he had many possessions. He was not hungering and thirsting for doing what was right, which in his case was to be detached from the things of this world. The next beatitude is, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Some read this as, Blessed are the pure of heart, 
for they will see God. I think it's important here, looking at this beatitude, to keep in mind the need for what is called purity of intention, or also known as motives. For every act that we do, there is a motive and intention behind it, and it must be good. In fact, an intention and motive is one of the three things, three sources, if you will, that make up the morality of an act. For the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1755, it says, a morally good act requires the goodness of the object, of the end, in other words, the motive or intention, and of the circumstances together. An evil end corrupts the action, even if the object is good in itself. So an example of this in the gospel is we recall when Jesus tells us to not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners in order to be seen by men. Yes, praying is something good in and of itself, but if it has an evil, disordered intention behind it, it's not a good act. So we need to reflect again. What are our motives and actions for even good things that we do? Let us make our actions holistic as possible. Also, this beatitude can be looked at as extending to purity of body, that is, chastity. St. John Chrysostom once said this about this beatitude. For as there are many merciful yet unchaste, to show that mercy alone is not enough, he, meaning Jesus, adds this beatitude concerning purity. As I was mentioning and alluding to earlier that the beatitudes point to the kingdom of heaven, which would entail also this beatitude, purity of heart, it would also, uh, on the opposite spectrum, entail that impurity or unchastity would point to the opposite direction, namely hell. For the sins against the sixth commandment are grave matters and are mortal sins if done with full knowledge and deliberate consent. And we have again the great sacrament of confession to forgive those mortal sins. Jesus has come and given us hope through the sacramental life of the church. I think it's uh, significant that I mention, as I'm talking about these things, we're in the year of celebrating the centennial 100-year anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima, in which the church is exhorting us to reflect on. And one of the messages of Our Lady of Fatima, which again, by the way, is an approved Marian apparition deemed worthy of belief by the church, the Blessed Mother said at Fatima that more souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than for any other reason. This is how serious of a matter this is. And therefore, we have this beatitude that we should keep on the forefront of our mind and our heart to help us stay on track, headed towards our ultimate destination. And last but not least, the beatitude of blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. St. Paul says in his second letter to Timothy, all who want to live religiously in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It is a hundred percent guarantee. Jesus Christ himself said in the gospel, no servant is greater than his master, and if Jesus Christ, who is the master himself, was persecuted, then we, the servants, if we are truly, authentically following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ to the T in which we should and are called to, then the end result is that we will inevitably be persecuted. If everybody loves us, 
there's something wrong with that picture. We would have to question if we are compromising for the truth. Now, if everybody hates us, that's not good either. Our Christian charity should be uh, attracting people to some degree, so there should be some sort of middle ground there. As St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us, that virtue always lies in the middle. I'll give you an example here. Uh, when I was in the seminary, uh, there was a, a very good professor that would teach us during homiletics class. He would say to the seminarians, uh, when you become a priest and you preach your homilies, some people will say they love your homilies, and some people will say they hate your homilies. Don't listen to any of them. Your job is to preach the truth, no less, of course, in charity. And the people persecute you for, for, for the truth, and well, that's up to them. You would be doing a disservice to the people by withholding the truth from them, even if one is going to be persecuted. And we see this great virtue of courage and also humility in the gospel by St. John the Baptist, right? He did not support King Herod's adulterous relationship. And as a result, he was eventually beheaded, martyred. But now he rejoices in the kingdom of heaven for his courage. And those who persecute us, you know, to make a light, positive angle at this, we should pray for them. As Jesus teaches in the gospel, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So these are just some select Beatitudes. I highly encourage all of us to dive deeper into these Beatitudes and the others not mentioned in this homily in hope that we walk safely on the path headed towards our ultimate destination, the greatest house where there is peace and joy forever. And in hope, may we hear Jesus say to us what he says in the Gospel of John chapter 14 when he says, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Amen.